Hey ho, tutor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tutor Time Machine, and this is episode 59 of our podcast. Thank you for listening to this, our penultimate chapter. But while this tale may be coming to an end, don't worry, we've got another one in the works. What if a lady in waiting wants to be on the stage? So join us as we talk about the history and entertain you with a story that might have happened. We love stories that might have happened. And help us continue. Support us. Buy some Tudor Time Machine swag. Go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. Hit the Shop Now button. Which is not super obvious. It's at the top of the page on the right. Uh, the Tudor Time Machine swag is pretty great looking. You can get a Do You Tudor tee or a Tudor Time Machine logo sweatshirt. And you'll be supporting us and we'll be so grateful. In our last episode, we saw Blackjack and Philomena reunited. Reunited and it feels so good. (laughs) But now we are returning to the Vasa ship where Constance is hoping to be presented to Cecilia and get the royal consent to stay aboard. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 59, The English Channel, in which the Vases set sail and Constance uses her key. Princess Cecilia adored men who captained ships, men who sailed about shouting orders, sending crews of well-formed seamen scurrying. It was as if they commanded tiny countries, and they had fine stories. This one was recounting a battle with a monkey. Cecilia had never thought monkeys fearsome, but the captain told a tale of stealing food and throwing rocks. How exotic to have a hairy beast claim one's dinner. She would no doubt come face to face with many terrible creatures during her soon-to-be eternal life. Yet immortality would make her fearless. She would festoon herself with serpents and ride bareback on lions, naked. Lady Godiva would be forgotten in the dust of Princess Cecilia Vasa. Oh, how delightful this man was as he mimed his heroic actions, as he fended off the furry animals. Brigitte, who sat by her side, laughed until she coughed and shook herself. A page appeared. Doradai wished a royal audience. No doubt the girl would ask for pay. Cecilia knew herself as soul of largesse, but her open hand had been shut by the usurous English. Doradai appeared holding up a cape as a curtain, a figure hidden behind. Doradai and the still-curtained phantom threw themselves at her feet. Cecilia clapped in delight. How she loved Doradai and her sense of presentation. The captain and Brigitte clapped in accord. Doradai began a low, warbling tune about a mermaid lost at sea and the princess who found her. Vaguely, Cecilia remembered the story being of a knight-errant, but the princess was a profound improvement. As Doradai reached a high note, she whipped the curtain off, revealing a woman's form. Rise! Cecilia bid her. Cecilia recognized the English girl who had joined her retinue at Bedford House, dressed cunningly as a Swedish maid. The girl opened her mouth and let loose a flat note that broke Cecilia's heart. I am Constance Stoner. I beg your grace's mercy. Again, the lass threw herself at Cecilia's feet, ready with supplication. How evenly her hair was parted. I could serve no other after serving such a one as you, Princess of Sweden. I languished out of the wonderful sphere of your presence. I rode miles over dangerous ground, dressed in ragged boy's clothes, so I might beg your leave to stay. Dear girl, said Cecilia, how could I have left you to the sadness of parting from me? What cruelty! I did not realize it myself. I honor your wisdom in seeking me out, for our happiness is in our own hands, is it not? And Providence smiled on your heart's desire. You are here dressed so fetchingly as a Swede. You must always adorn yourself so. Rise, I must kiss you. Constance rose as she was bid, and let herself be embraced by the princess. But her eye, however, stuck to Cecilia's waist. Wyatt's pomander. It could not be. She, she and Philomena, they had searched and searched, and here it was on a chain about the princess's waist. How did Cecilia get it? Was it not the property of Francis Darrell? How had this transfer come to pass? She would never know. But here it was, at last. 
Even though the dream of the relic was gone, curiosity filled her. She wanted to hold the pomander, feel the weight of it, to try the key. She wanted to know, once and for all, that the thing was empty. Princess, you are a goddess in the flesh, said Constance with great humility. Allow me, madam, as a first service, to fill your pomander with sweet herbs. Pleased and impressed by this girl's good sense, Cecilia held the globe up and sighed. Is it not beautiful? And the joy I had in its acquisition from one of your countrymen. A fine figure of a man, but it will not open. The key is lost. Madam, I shall take it to the gallery and find a means to open it. Cecilia laughed as she undid her waist links. Here, if you are able, you shall do your charge. Constance escaped to the deck. The sun was bright and the waves curled and clouds rippled along the horizon. Why did she feel such a rush to open this jewel? It would be empty of anything of import. And yet she felt nervous as she drew the key from her neck and slid it into the lock. A tiny click and the pomander popped open, revealing a single compartment. A folded piece of material, unevenly edged, as if it had been ripped, resided within. Holding the pomander up, Constance grasped the edge between her thumb and forefinger and wiggled it out. She placed the pomander around her own waist so she could attend the small package. She opened it to witness words scratched onto the fabric, written in a shaky hand and thoroughly blotted, but still legible. My own Thomas, we wait for final rest. I must one last time surprise you. You have thought I loathed you, spurned you yet again, that my heart was as changeable as the wind. But it is a lie. I die innocent, and yet I wish I died in sin. Once Henry and I were bounded by an oath. I could not see you again, because you lived so strongly in my heart and soul and mind. Your flesh made me weak, Thomas. I hid myself, dare I say it. I wished our child to be safe. Elizabeth is your own blood and mine. Elizabeth is our child. The torment and fear and glory of it. I could not deny you truth of it in these hours. I know you will believe me true. I wanted to protect you from his wrath. I took the king as my lover to cover my pregnancy. And yet because the king is shadow of you, no one dreamed it. A red-haired and hearty babe, her early arrival. But she was not early, but a late birth. I have had little fortune, but that one saved many. Is she not our beautiful girl? My dear Thomas, why else, why else but to preserve our child? Would I take the king to bed after holding him at bay? The nothing words I shared with you these past years, how they hang on me. You who know words, you who love to write the bite of a lover's wrong, how I wished to show you my mind. Love of Thomas in every thought. God's mercy on our souls. May we both be united in death to sweetly clasp hands. Humbly I pray to be granted your words of forgiveness. Your devoted mistress, ever and always, Anne. This letter was the object dear sister wanted destroyed. The talk of execution and lost friends. Wyatt wrote not of Sir Thomas More, the Catholic martyr, but of Anne. Anne Boleyn, whom he had loved. This letter was Wyatt's prize, his treasure, his relic. His sister feared for its discovery, and well she should. This scrap in Constance's hand had consequence. Elizabeth was not the rightful Queen of England, not a tutor. She had no claim. How could it be that the lady crowned at Westminster, who held the scepter and the orb, who ordered all the girls do la volta before dawn, was no queen at all? It was impossible. Aunt Stoner was right. Elizabeth was a bastard and a usurper. Mary of Scots was the true Queen of England. With this scrap of cloth in her hand, Constance could herself return, play the Catholic heroine, and drive Elizabeth out. She would be heralded, her family exalted. She could marry Rutland. She could marry Rutland. Rutland. He would not hide her. She would be a favorite of Queen Mary. He would be proud to be married to a stoner. Her name would become a badge of honor. The Catholics would rule the nation as it ought to be. She read the words again. Elizabeth is your own blood and mine. Elizabeth is our child. 
The Queen did not know she was not the child of Henry Tudor. She believed in her own right to the throne. If Constance appeared a Catholic stoner with this damning missive, would Elizabeth believe and step aside? She would not. The Queen would fight. She would call it a Catholic plot. She would not yield. She would say the words were a forgery. Should Constance present this truth? Was it not a duty? This information would rally the Catholics and bring cries from Elizabeth. Scotland would march. There would be war. These words were a declaration of war. Would Rutland fight on the side of Elizabeth? What thoughts? On rushing time could not be untangled by her imagination. Perhaps Spain would lay a claim. It was not her duty to sort the thread, only to uphold the truth. Her aunt would love Constance as she placed this dagger in the lady's open hand. Fate would take its course. Constance's action would be right. How I wish to show you my mind, love of Thomas in every thought. The heartsick poems Wyatt wrote at Anne's loss, his bitter loneliness. He suffered the years she was wife to King Henry. What tormenting relief Anne's final words must have brought to Wyatt. If Rutland sent her a note claiming his heartlessness, she would see him as a different man entirely. Rutland would not cling to a letter she penned, not risk such danger. Thomas's devotion led him to keep the confession of Anne's love and the glory of a daughter close at hand, locked in the pomander about his neck. He should not have. It would lead to his dear daughter's loss of the throne. It was so terrible. It seemed the keepsake of a great love, such as they had had, should cure all. She, Constance Stoner, held the fate of that daughter in her hands. She could set the court in an uproar, just as Anne Boleyn had done. She could scoff at their love, reveal their secret, dash Anne's hope, crush Thomas's legacy. Why had he not burnt this letter? Why had he not burnt it? And why had it come to her to bring down a queen? Why did she stand here on the deck of a ship with too much in mind? Thomas should have taken his sister's advice. Anne Boleyn was a liar. Why should anyone pity her? Anne was a witch. She deceived the king. She deceived all the people of England. But Thomas did not know. Perhaps if he had, he would have counseled differently. They might have fled together to, to Sweden, had he known. Constance gave up the struggle within herself. She could not ask Princess Cecilia to take her home to deliver the letter. She could not betray Thomas Wyatt. She could reason with herself. Rutland would not want her. Anyway, his faux poetic soul had become unappealing. Her aunt might marry her off to some other worthy Catholic, or the Queen might banish all Catholics. These were not reasons to return. She laughed to herself that the truth was simply that she loved Thomas Wyatt's poems, that he had lived and loved, and she could not spoil his secret. She folded the scrap and placed it back where he had wanted it. Clicking the mechanism shut, she took the little key and turned it. It was locked again as it should be. She looked back to her England, the key in her fist, and holding it out above the churning waters, dropped it into the sea. Constance has made her decision. She will not go back to England. No, because the secret in this letter is so dangerous. It will cause a huge amount of trouble for Constance. Yes, she could go back and give this letter to those Catholics who want to depose the queen. But on the other side, there will always be cries of forgery and foul play. And frankly, Constance could lose her life. You just never knew and you still don't know how things are going to go when you introduce something like this. Constance is going to go off into the unknown. Sweden is a huge journey. It's almost 2,000 miles. And I'm not sure where the vastest ship would have landed. There were always land disputes going on between the Swedes and the Danes and the Polish. So traveling over land was very difficult. But I read that Cecilia did not go back to Sweden right away when she left London, but she went to her husband's place in Baden. Sweden was pretty chaotic in the 1560s because Cecilia's brother, King Eric, was basically insane. True. And Baden was part of the Holy Roman Empire at the time. Now it's in modern Germany on the border of France. It's a beautiful spot if you look at pictures of it. And we love to think of Constance exploring the Black Forest and crossing the border over to Strasbourg to visit the Gothic Cathedral of Notre Dame. She would have loved all that stuff. Cecilia and her ladies did return to Sweden in 1571. 
And Cecilia was granted her own personal fiefdom. She must have loved that. Yes, it was the city <laughs> I have of a fiefdom. <laughs> the city of Arboga. And she was granted her own fleet of ships, which mm. she used for commercial shipping. And she also used them as pirate ships. Her brother, John, was then king of Sweden. And he granted her permission to use the ships in the Baltic Sea to harass the Dutch and the English ships doing business with Russia and with Russian ships as part of the hostilities between Russia and Sweden. Yeah, I think there were always hostilities between Russia and Sweden. I think it was a little bit like England and France. But I like to think that maybe Constance ran away to sea with a corsair. Or became a pirate herself. Yeah, why not? Eventually, Cecilia's husband, the Margrave, died. And she actually spent years trying to take over his lands in the name of their underage son, Edward Fortuna. Around this time, Elizabeth I offered Cecilia the hand of Sir Robert Dudley. Seems a little <laughs> random. She was always offering Robert Dudley's hand. Maybe it was the negotiating tool to keep Cecilia out of the hands of the Spanish. I think that was probably what it was, because Elizabeth wanted her on her side. And probably... Because she turned Dudley down and to solidify her own position with the Spanish, who, of course, at this time controlled the Holy Roman Empire, Cecilia officially converted to Catholicism. She's very practical in certain so ways. She fled Sweden for Baden with the Spanish ambassador, Francisco de Arraso, and she actually lived openly with him. And they had a daughter in 1579 who was sadly put in a convent at the orders of Cecilia's now grown son, Edward Fortunus, and this was completely against Cecilia's will. She wanted this young girl to live with her. So she was brought up in this convent. And if she was anything like her mother, I'm sure she gave those nuns a very hard time. I hope she did. Cecilia tried to get her out, but she actually was not able to see her daughter again until 1622. And that was after her daughter had taken orders as an adult and taken the name Charitas. In those days, after you took orders, that was sort of the end. You couldn't get out. Cecilia was the subject of nasty propaganda from the Protestants who were upset at her conversion to Catholicism. There were stories about her running a whorehouse and having other illegitimate children. And her brothers and then her own son were constantly taking power and land away from her. She was not immortal. <laughs> no despite drinking that potion made yes. by Illinois. But she did live to the ripe old age of 86. And she's buried in the Church of St. Nick in Rodemack, France, which is near the border with Germany. It's interesting that she is Swedish, but she spent so much of her time in the Holy Roman Empire. And then she's weirdly now buried in France. But, you know, in the end, it's hard to judge Cecilia because she was obviously intelligent and well-educated and smart and ambitious. And she was sexually free. Clearly, her family were a bit unstable, but that didn't stop any of the brothers from holding power to all kinds of questionable decisions and extramarital love affairs. The double standard is really, truly crushing. It's unbelievable. So much is made of Cecilia's sexual freedom, but her brothers can have a harem. And I often think Anne Boleyn was crushed by that double standard as well. In our story, if she had been the king, she could have been the sovereign and taken Sir Thomas Wyatt as a lover and had as many children by him as she wanted with no problem at all. But because she was a woman, those things cost her her life. But everything now has to be hidden away by Constance. And she can't quite get herself to destroy Anne's letter. She puts it back where Thomas Wyatt wanted it to be. Anne Boleyn's letter will be locked away in the pomander and that pomander will be in the possession of the unsuspecting Cecilia Vasa. In time, Cecilia will likely pawn such a valuable bauble and the letter will pass on to a new owner in another country who might discover it. Or might have the pomander melted down and the letter will be burnt and never come to light. Like so many historical secrets. The survival of any historical record is completely a matter of luck. It's so true. And often those documents that do come to light are extremely hard to authenticate. Oh, you're thinking about that letter that may or may not have been a forgery that Anne Boleyn is supposed to have written to Henry during her imprisonment in the tower. Yes, I think it's so interesting. I think it's something that's fascinated all fans of Anne Boleyn. And it is a bit long, but I'm going to read the whole thing so that we can kind of really get into it. It says, Sir, your grace's displeasure and my imprisonment 
are things so strange to me that what to write or what to excuse, I am altogether ignorant. Whereas you send to me, willing me to confess a truth and so obtain your favor, by such a one whom you know to be mine ancient professed enemy. I no sooner received this message by him than I rightly conceived your meaning. And if, as you say, confessing a truth indeed may procure my safety, I shall with all willingness and duty perform your duty. But let not your grace ever imagine that your poor wife will be brought to acknowledge a fault where not so much as a thought ever proceeded. And to speak a truth, never a prince had wife more loyal in all duty and in all true affection than you have ever found in Anne Boleyn, with which name and place I could willingly have contented myself if God and your grace's pleasure had been so pleased. Neither did I at any time so far forget myself in my exultation or received queenship, but that I always looked for such alteration as I now find, for the ground of my preferment being on no surer foundation than your grace's fancy. The least alteration was fit and sufficient, I knew, to draw that fancy to some other subject. You have chosen me from low estate to be your queen and companion, far beyond my desert or desire. If, then, you found me worthy of such honor, good your grace, let not any light fancy or bad counsel of my enemies withdraw your princely favor from me. Neither let that stain, that unworthy stain, of a disloyal heart towards your good grace ever cast so foul a lot on me and on the infant princess your daughter. Try me, good king, but let me have a lawful trial, and let not my sworn enemies sit as my accusers and as my judges. Yea, let me receive an open trial, for my truth shall fear no open shame. Then you shall see either my innocence he cleared, your suspicions and conscience satisfied, the ignominy and slander of the world stop, or my guilt openly declared." so that whatever God and you may determine of, your grace may be freed from an open censure, and my offense being so lawfully proved, your grace may be at liberty, both before God and man, not only to execute worthy punishment on me as an unfaithful wife, but to follow your affection already settled on that party, for whose sake I am now as I am, whose name I could some while since have pointed unto, your grace being not ignorant of my suspicions there. Therein. But if you have already determined of me, and that not only my death, but an infamous slander must bring you the joying of your desired happiness, then I desire of God that he will pardon your great sin herein, and likewise my enemies, the instruments thereof, and that he will not call you to a straight account for your unprincely and cruel usage of me at his general judgment seat, where both you and myself must shortly appear, and in whose just judgment I doubt not, whatsoever the world may think of of me, mine innocency shall be openly known and sufficiently cleared. My last and only request shall be that myself only bear the burden of your grace's displeasure, and that it may not touch the innocent souls of those poor gentlemen, whom, as I understand, are likewise in straight imprisonment for my sake. If ever I have found favor in your sight, if ever the name of Anne Boleyn have been pleasing in your ears, then let me obtain this request, and so I will leave to trouble your grace any further with my earnest prayer to the Trinity to have your grace in his good keeping and to direct you in all your actions from my doleful prison in the tower, the 6th May. That is quite some letter. If in fact it was written by Anne, it did not move Henry in any way because she was executed two weeks later. Yeah, and her trial was not fair. And she was tried by her enemies, and her guilt was a foregone conclusion. And her plea for the innocent men was also ignored. And the infant princess, your daughter, was bastardized and removed from the succession. The background on this letter is that it is a contemporaneous copy of Anne's original letter, and that it was found in Thomas Cromwell's papers after he was executed in 1540. But when exactly it came to light is a bit murky. Let's say it was actually found with Cromwell's papers in 1540. The king was still very much alive. Surely he would have had the letter destroyed. You know, who found it and who hung on to it for years until it came to light during Elizabeth's reign? I've read that it might be an Elizabethan forgery and that it was devised to be presented to Elizabeth to rehabilitate her mother and to show her mother's innocence. 
Well, that makes sense in terms of a reason to create such a forgery. And it makes sense the idea that it is a copy that Cromwell made of the original letter penned by Anne. That's a good excuse for why it is clearly not in Anne's actual handwriting. But many historians, including Eric Ives and Alison Weir, argued that the letter is definitely a fake because no 16th century prisoner would have dared to write so aggressively to the king. But to me, the tone of the letter actually argues for its authenticity because a 16th century forger might have made Anne's tone a little more softer and more groveling. That might have been more convincing to a 16th century reader. Maybe this tone would sort of put a 16th century reader off a little bit. But by all accounts, Anne was considered unconventional in her manner of speaking to the king. And certainly this letter is pretty consistent with that. I agree. And the specifics in it argued, I think, for its being authentic. So for instance, where she says that the king sent a man he knows to be her enemy, which is referring, I think, to the Duke of Norfolk, her uncle, to question her. That seems something that would really have pissed Anne off. I mean, and also she's essentially saying to the king, like, stop this ridiculous, absurd persecution and I'll get out of the way for you to have your thing with that party whom I have already told you I had suspicions about and is the whole reason you are doing this. Jane Seymour. Yeah, Anne's making it pretty clear. The letter, it's so direct and so so personal to Anne's specific relationship to the king. To me, it does feel like a wife, an angry, blindsided wife talking to her husband. Well, maybe it's a very smart 16th century forger who knew all the facts, took Anne's character into account when forging the letter. And that person was just a real talent. Oh, maybe it was William Shakespeare. He forged it. Maybe. <laughs> In fact, Hermione's speech in A Winter's Tale, it reminds me a little bit of this letter. I know you're right. When she stands up to her dictatorial, suspicious, jealous king husband, Leantes, when he falsely accuses her of adultery and he has her tried for her life, like that bit where she says, <laughs> but yet hear this, mistake me not, no life, I prize it not a straw, but for mine honor, which I would free. If I shall be condemned upon surmises, all proofs sleeping else but what your jealousies away i tell you tis rigor and not law your honors all i do refer me to the oracle yeah, it has the same tone as Anne's letter and the same situation but the fact that the letter is not in Anne's handwriting means that historians will be arguing over its authenticity forever yeah i guess it would make sense that cromwell would have had a copy made if he did in fact pass the original letter to the king there's no record of the king getting such a letter and no contemporary accounts of such a letter making its way to him yeah and that would have been such a big event at court, you would have thought somebody would have said something about it. It's not like the Spanish ambassador Chupues, who always seems to know what's going on, wrote to his master, King Philip, saying, Hothead Henry was really pissed off because of this letter that went out of the tower from the whore. I mean, Chupues was always calling Anne the whore, right? Although Henry could have received the original letter actually been extremely upset, furious, and then he could have destroyed it. But I just feel like there would have been some court knowledge of that. If Cromwell really did get this letter from Anne, he must have weighed whether to give it to Henry or not. And maybe he decided not to give it to Henry. Why? You think Cromwell would have worried it would soften Henry and save Anne? That goes back to the discussion of who was the driver of this plot against Anne, Cromwell or Henry. Because if Cromwell was the driver, he might have kept the letter back from Henry. But then why make a copy? Why don't we have Anne's original letter? Because if it was ever found, it could get Cromwell into huge trouble for withholding it. So it seems like it would be wiser to destroy it, not make a copy of it. If you think about Henry's temper, it could have gotten Cromwell in terrible trouble if he gave the letter to the king. Mm -hmm. And possibly the letter is not in Anne's writing because she dictated it to someone she trusted. My candidate there would be Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, maybe Anne felt like she wasn't in any condition to write it. So she asked someone to write it down for her. And that's why it's in a different penmanship. Cranmer was the only person who insisted on Anne's innocence, even to the king himself. To me, if anybody would have been bold enough to pass such a letter to the king, it would have been Thomas Cranmer. Some historians cite the fact that the letter is signed Anne Boleyn and not Anne the Queen as a signal to the fact 
that it must be fake. Anne would have definitely signed it and the queen. But again, that makes me feel like the letter is genuine because Anne is talking to the king as the woman she once was before he elevated her. I mean, she keeps saying it was your desire to elevate me. I always knew that the fall could come. She's writing from that place and from the place of her being the woman he loved. She's not pulling rank as the queen. She's appealing to Henry emotionally and she's going through their long and intense marriage and companionship. There's so much interesting debate about this letter. Anyway, we'll leave our listeners to decide for themselves whether the letter was actually penned by Anne or forged, whether it's real or fake. Yes, give us your opinion on the Tudor Time Machine Facebook page. We love hearing people's opinions about these things because our minds are open. Yes, (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and imagine all the letters and artifacts from this period of Tudor history that must still be out there in the world, hiding in some library or in someone's shed. It's exciting to imagine what might turn up. Like that Sir Thomas Wyatt was really the father of Elizabeth I? Why not? He was red haired. So was Elizabeth. He was tall. So was she. He was a genuine lover of art, music and poetry. And so was she. He loved Anne Boleyn, her mother, and they were close. So I feel it's a genuine possibility. I think we're also a little uh, pushed that way for our genuine dislike of Henry. (laughs) You never know what Tudor bombshell might be around the corner. It's exciting. Listen in to the last episode of this story next time. But coming soon, we will be sharing our new tale, and that will have a ton of bombshells. Sort of uh, Tudor and Stuart bombshells. We're yes. moving on in time a little bit. Any adventure requires a little danger. Of course. And don't forget to tell a friend about the podcast. So tune in next time for more Times Riddle and more Tudor minded talk. Bye.